My name is Joseph Pivato. Uh, most people call me Joe. We live in a house here in Edmonton, Alberta. Edmonton is about uh, 300 uh, kilometers east of the Rocky Mountains in Western Canada. Uh, I came out to Edmonton in 1970 to do my PhD at the University of Alberta. And in 1976, 77, got a job at Athabasca University, a distance education university, and I've been there ever since. I retired in 2015. I've been here in Alberta both to do graduate work and, uh, and also to teach at the University of Alberta. I, I've been teaching Canadian literature, comparative literature, English literature, and in all those courses I managed to include a lot of uh, Italian-Canadian writers uh, and other ethnic minority writers. So I've, I've given my students, my Canadian students, a uh, different perspective on what English literature is and what Canadian literature is. I like writing. I've been writing since I was in grade seven. Uh, I've, as an academic, I've written mostly academic essays uh, and books, but I've also written short stories. I've written poems. Uh, and uh, at the present time, I'm working on a collection of, of, of short stories a collection of stories about uh, family members, my extended family. Emma, my wife, is uh, also a writer. She's published uh, seven um, mystery novels, and the number eight is coming out soon. And uh, she's also uh, finished a book of memoirs about our life with our youngest daughter. Uh, we have three children. Our oldest son, Marcus Yanni, is in Paris uh, at the, the University of Sergi Pontoise teaching economics. Our middle daughter, Juliana, is an artist and teaches at the University of Toronto Scarborough, and she has two children. Uh, our youngest daughter, Alexis, uh, still lives with us at home. She is severely disabled, severely disabled, and uh, we uh, are able to keep her at home with staffing to take care of her uh, from 8 in the morning till 10 o'clock at night. And this staff is paid for by the provincial government of Alberta. We were able to organize by establishing a society, a home within a home society, we're able to establish society to keep Alexis home with us. So she goes for walks every day around the neighborhood. Uh, the, uh, the staff uh, feed her, they bathe her, they, uh, they do the physiotherapy with her every day. And so they keep her, uh, they keep her life as normal as possible. We've also done things like uh, take Alexis with us on vacation. We've taken her to to uh, our vacation in, uh, in Mexico 13 times. That's two weeks vacation in the beaches of Mexico, Playa del Carmen. We've also taken her to the mountains. We've taken her to Toronto. She went to Chicago for her uh, sister's graduation from the uh, University of uh, the, uh, the Art Institute of Chicago, so, uh, law art school. Um, and we've taken her to other, other places in Alberta, Calgary, uh, uh, Drumheller, uh, Canmore, etc. Uh, Banff, Jasper, the mountains. Our experience uh, to, uh, to normalize a life for someone as severely handicapped as, as Alexis has given us a different perspective on uh, individual differences of people, of the, the handicapped, but also people of, of different uh, ethnicities, uh, religion, uh, personalities, genders, and so forth. And we've taken this perspective into our writing. Uh, and into our uh, teaching. It gives us a different uh, point of view on, on the world. The fact that uh, Canada has a mul official multiculturalism policy uh, makes uh, everybody in Canada a little more tolerant to difference, to ethnic diversity, to pluralism, and so forth. So we're more open, and uh, this is, this is uh, a perspective that we share with the, with the rest of the people in the country. We, we don't find this kind of openness, this kind of multicultural positive attitude in places like Europe, such as, for example, places like uh, Italy or France uh, or the UK. The UK, for example, has a policy, an anti-immigration policy, to try and keep people out of the country rather than uh, people in the country. 
The work in Italian Canadian writers began with Pier Giorgio Di Cicco, who contacted me from Toronto in 1976, 77, that he was doing an anthology of Italian Canadian poets. And I sent him some poems, and in 1978 he published Roman Candles, which was one of the first anthologies of Italian Canadian writers. And uh, that caused me and a number of other people to discover the fact that Canada had a number of Italian Canadian writers in Montreal, Toronto, Vancouver, Edmonton, and elsewhere, who were beginning to write about their identity, about the Italian Canadian experience, about immigration, about trips to Italy, about their relationship with their parents, about language problems, about the dual identity, uh, the position of women, when we were dealing with that forum. So we began to discover ourselves. So we, we ended up a meeting in Toronto and in Montreal. We were invited to give talks, to, to go to book launchings. Um, we had a big conference in Rome in 1984, which was basically focused on immigration history, but they allowed some writers to come there. So we met, some, some of us met for the first time face to face. And Antonio D'Alfonso, who had been, in 78 had started Guernica Editions, we began to talk about doing, doing something to promote Italian Canadian writers. So we came up with the idea of, as Antonio said, to criticize ourselves. That is to produce a book of, uh, of criticism about, about the writers. We came up with this book, Contrast, Comparative Essays on Italian Canadian Writing. Comparative essays because we're dealing with writers that work in English, in French, and Italian. And so here we have contributions from uh, uh, eight or nine different contributors writing essays about uh, various problems. The language problem, the novel, uh, identity, writing in French, uh, the position of Italian culture, and so forth. So this became, we were naive about this book, we were just trying to do something to promote our writers, but this book became a seminal anthology that promoted the discovery of ethnic minority writers in Canada, not just Italian Canadian writers, but ethnic minority writers. So it, it prompted other groups, uh, South Asian writers, uh, the Ukrainian writers, the Japanese writers, the Chinese writers, and other minority groups to uh, examine what they were doing to form networks, to form associations, to uh, publish journals and so forth, to promote their, their book, to, uh, you know, to deal with the community, to uh, respond to the community needs of, of, uh, of writing and identity and, and social problems, because we're dealing with social problems, not just literary ones. So that's what we, that's what we, we did. That's the first book that we produced and uh, it, it, uh, it uh, changed everything. Changed everything. I was in Australia in uh, uh, one year, and one of the works one of the books I worked on was uh, a collection of my own essays, and this came out as Echo, and this was published. And I have to look at this, 1994. So I was in Australia in '92 uh, at the uh, Sydney Univer University of uh, uh, Macquarie University in Sydney, Australia, and so this is one of the uh, collections of essays I came out. It was also published in, in this smaller edition. So these two books began to be used in university courses to examine ethnic writing in Canada, these two books. They were used in university courses. And the other one that we, that we brought out in Guernica, the other book that, that uh, brought out was this Anthology of Italian Canadian Writers. And uh, this came out in 98, 1998. So, these books were used in university and college courses for about 10 years uh, to talk about uh, Italian-Canadian writers and other ethnic minority writers in Canada. It changed my career and the career of a number of other people because of uh, the work that we did. Uh, Antonio and Alfonso and I at Guernica began a series, uh, a monograph series, on Canadian writers, uh, the Essential Writers series. And so we began by, uh, by began with two writers 
from Western Canada. One of them was Katharina Edwards, that's the, uh, one of the books that I produced. And the other writer was Sharon Pollock. And so we, we continued from there looking at many other Canadian writers, but we also included a number of Italian writers in that. So for example, the other book that I produced in that series was the one on Frank Pacci. And then I did one on uh, Mary Di Michele. And I did one on Pier Giorgio Di Chico, a man who initially produced Roman Tamils. I contributed to, uh, to other books. I continued this by looking at other Canadian writers. Sheila Watson, a professor I knew here at the University of Alberta, she wrote uh, The Double Hook. And also George Eliot Clark. I did a book on George Eliot Clark, who was an African Canadian writer. So the series has continued. Uh, I contributed to other books in the series. One, one was uh, one on Roy Kiyoka. This is a number 53 in the series. That's how many books we've done so far, number 53. This book on Roy Kiyoka, who's a writer and artist, was, I contributed to this book. Uh, it was edited by uh, that uh, Juliana Pivata, was the, uh, our daughter who lives in Montreal. I also contributed to other books, such as the one on Antonio D'Alfonso, and another one which is coming out on, on uh, Pasquale Verdicchio, which is, uh, I, haven't, I don't have a copy of that yet. Antonio asked me a question about uh, Alexis, our daughter Alexis, uh, and the relationship between her disabilities and uh, my, my work on ethnic minority writing. And, um, based, Alexis was born in January 1978. Roman candles appeared in July 1978. So it's just a coincidence they are both the same year. Um, when she was first born, she was a, just a beautiful, a happy little baby, and nobody real, really uh, was aware of the fact that she was disabled, as severely disabled as she is. It's only uh, as, as uh, months went on and she didn't meet the normal milestones, for example, of sitting up or crawling or so forth, that uh, we had to have this, uh, we, couldn't, we couldn't figure out what the problem was. Uh, doctors in Edmonton thought it was some kind of metabolic disorder, but that didn't work out. We finally had to take her to Sick Children's Hospital in Toronto, and uh, after they looked at her for a couple of days, they told Emma she's very severely disabled and she's blind and she's having seizures all the time. And so from that point on, we have to take uh, drastic action uh, and uh, put her on medication uh, uh, for seizure, uh, control her seizures, and uh, so forth and so on. So it's been an interesting uh, trip. At the same time, of course, I, I started paying more and more attention to ethnic minority writers, uh, writers who were being neglected, who were being uh, marginalized, and so forth, and some of these are Italian-Canadian writers. I, I gave my first conference paper on Italian-Canadian writers in 1981 in Halifax, at a big conference of Canadian writing. But, even though there was interest at the conference, nobody wanted to publish the paper. I sent it to a number of Canadian journals, nobody wanted to publish it. One rejected it as too esoteric, okay? I finally published it in a sociology journal, Canadian Ethnic Studies, Canadian Ethnic Studies. And they, they were doing a special issue on ethnicity and Canadian literature, and they accepted my paper. One of the editors for this issue was Robert Croach. This journal uh, was very supportive of Italian Canadian writers because it would often publish reviews on Italian Canadian books that, that didn't appear in any other journals. So they helped to give Italian Canadian writing academic credibility. Okay, so uh, it's a mistake to reject the whole idea of ethnic, the word ethnic as somehow being a, a, another form of the N-word, uh, or ethnic minority. What ethnic minority implies, and I belong to an ethnic minority, and most Italian Canadian writers do too, what that implies is that Canada has an ethnic majority, the Anglo people, the people of English, Irish, Welsh background. They're the majority in Canada. 
The other minority in Canada are the French, the people of French background. And Italian Canadians, uh, Ukrainian Canadians, uh, Filipinos Canadians, uh, German Canadians, Hungarian Canadians, we are all in the minority. So we are an ethnic minority and the ethnic majority is the English. So you can see that accepting the term ethnic minority implies that there's an ethnic majority. And we're just, it's a relationship that we have with them. A number of Italian Canadians, uh, and that include also the writers, they have a problem now with being called Italian or being called Canadian or being called Italian Canadian. Uh, I grew up in the 1950s, which had uh, the, the Canadian society of the 1950s was very much an assimilationist society. That was what you were supposed to do. You were supposed to assimilate as quickly as possible into the mainstream of English Canadian uh, culture. So when I went to school in uh, 52, when I went to grade one in 52 the, at a Catholic school, the Catholic nuns uh, changed my name from Giuseppe to Joseph, which became Joe. And I never, and that, that's what happened. And a, a couple of years later, when my sister went to another Catholic school, we moved to another Catholic school. Her, her Italian name is Luigina. And the nuns there too, they said, well, you should, it's very difficult. Uh, kids are going to make fun of you. You should just simplify it and call yourself Louise. And she did, and never looked back. So when you have a name like Joe and Louise, it's easy to assimilate and blend into uh, Canadian society, mainstream English Canadian society. If you have a name like Pasquale and you don't change it to Pasco or something like that, then it becomes more difficult. Or if you have a name, if you have a name like Mario, it's more acceptable. Uh, at least in the 50s, probably not, but now it is because, of, because we have a number of hockey players who also are called Mario. That, that, makes, that makes a difference, right? Who, where the name is being used. So I have no trouble identifying myself as Italian Canadian with a hyphen. Okay? I was born in Italy. I came here in 1952. Uh, I assimilated into Canadian society. And so I, I, have, I have both perspectives. I can be critical of both points of view. I don't have uh, uh, powerful nostalgia to go back to Italy and go back there and live there. I don't have any of that idea. The, the, I have an interesting aspect of my background. My grandfather, my mother's father, came here in 1904 to work, he was a stonemason, to work uh, for the railway, railway construction. He did not lay tracks, he built things like bridges, viaducts, uh, buildings and so forth. He worked with brick and stone and cement. Okay, His, he loved Canada and uh, he came back in 1912 to get married and then he returned to Canada again. His idea was to bring the whole, his whole family over to Canada. So his first son, he gave him a, an, an English name, Gianni, but they called his spelled it in Italian, J-A-N-N-I, became, which became Gianni. And even my mother, my mother's name was Mary, M-E-R-I, Mary, because they were planning to come to Canada. And so he came back to fight in the First World War, survived the First World War, but after the war, my grandmother said, no, I don't want to go to Canada. And so they remained in Italy. So I was born in Italy. But he always had that dream. He always talked about Canada till the day he died. So when my mother and her brother, uh, uh, whose name is Tony, had the opportunities to come to Canada after the war, they did. So my uncle Tony came to Canada in 1950, then my father in 51, and then we came in 52. And uh, we decided to stay. So according to my mother, she was fulfilling her father's dream of coming to Canada and remaining in Canada. So I have a different perspective about uh, the value or my connection to Italy. And, uh, and I, that's, I'm happy with that. So I, I have no problem with identifying as Italian or Italian-Canadian with a hyphen. So, so when we started the Association of Italian-Canadian Writers, we had the hyphenated name in the English in the French and the Italian titles, okay? Now people who belong to the society, they don't want to really want to use the word Italian. I'm thinking if they don't want to use the word Italian, they should join the Canadian Authors Association. That way they don't have to worry about any kind of Italian uh, connection. I mean, a lot of Italian Americans have changed their name. Right? They, cha they changed their Italian name to some Anglo name, some English name, uh, because, because of the problems with identity 
and uh, uh, being Italian in America. But very few Italians in Canada have changed their name, but some, some do. So there, there is this problem of, uh, of among some people which I can appreciate and can understand, but I don't really have much sympathy with it. If that's their choice, that's fine. Today, I received my copy of the new uh, book on Pasquale Verdicchio. I contributed an essay to this book, so I'm very happy about that. Looks, uh, looks very good. Pasquale Verdicchio, part of the uh, Guernica Writer Series. It's number 54. That's how many volumes we've published so far, 54. My training for both my master's degree and my PhD, which I received at both at the University of Alberta, is in comparative literature. Comparative literature uh, studies literatures in different languages and compares them uh, or contrasts them. I was never comfortable just being in an English department. I could not identify with the Anglo-American perspective of an English department. I also had an Italian culture that I had to deal with. The first book we brought out on Italian Canadian writers has a contrast. Comparative essays on con Canadian, uh, Italian Canadian writing, it had a number of essays which took a comparative approach. It looked at the English writers, ones who wrote, wrote in English, the ones that wrote in French, the ones that wrote in Italian. And since then, we've also uh, looked at the writers that produce books in, uh, in uh, dialects, for example, uh, in 2015, I brought out uh, Rina Crowley's book, From Friuli, which is a collection of essays in Friulano, translated into English. And I also had a critical essay in there. So, uh, other people have talked about uh, writers that write in Calabrian or the Roman dialect. I don't see that ending. I don't see a work on Italian, on the diversity of Italian Canadian writer ending anytime soon, because Canada is becoming more and more ethnically diverse. And there are more and more ethnically diverse writers in Canada, even though some of them don't want to be identified as ethnic minority or South Asian writers or whatever. I mean, some of them want to be, some of them don't even want to be identified as Canadian writers. They want to be simply as writers, international writers. Well, that's fine. That's good. What, whatever you want to self-identify. Uh, but in terms of academic work, you often have to categorize writers in a certain way and you have to add certain labels such as South Asian writers or uh, Japanese Canadian writer or, you know, uh, Ukrainian Canadian or Italian Canadian. Uh, the year after I, uh, I retired in 2015, I started working on a book on comparative essays for the new century. Now this book is the first book on Canadian uh, comparative literature published in Canada. All the other textbooks are American or British. This is the first one that has a Canadian perspective, intentionally a Canadian perspective. Most of the contributors are Canadian academics, young academics. And a number of the essays they work on deal with ethnic minority writers. There are a number of essays here on Italian Canadian writers. They talk about translation, they talk about identity, People such as Antonio D'Alfonso, Pasquale Verdicchio, Mary Di Michele, Pier Giorgio Di Cicco, uh, Caterina Edwards, uh, Jenny Gunn, all kinds of writers are mentioned in here. I have faith that the future will continue to look at ethnic diversity. It doesn't mean that we're going to neglect the mainstream writers, but we also have to pay attention to the diverse writers. So uh, I see that going on and I see that continuing and I think the influence of academics, of Canadian academics who have looked at uh, ethnic minority writing, uh, plural, pluralism, uh, diversity, multiculturalism, this is influencing also academics in places like Italy, in places like France, in places like the UK. I've been to all those places where people uh, are giving papers on some form of ethnic identity, some problem with multiculturalism, the conflict or the relationship between majority cultures and minority cultures. I mean, ethnic ethnicity just simply means cultural difference. It does, doesn't mean anything more than that. It's just that some countries in the world, for example, France, who ha which has a large uh, population of uh, African, uh, people of African descent and people of, of Arabic uh, Muslim descent, does not want to keep any statistics on these people. They pretend like they're all going to assimilate into, into the French society, but of course they don't. If you don't keep statistics on the, the difference 
different populations and how they're doing and what their problems are, you can never address them. You can never address them, and that, that is a problem with not, whereas Canada does keep a, 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 a study, we do study ethnic minorities, populations in Canada, their problems, their so forth and so on. For example, with, with the COVID-19 crisis uh, pa pandemic, we know that certain people are of cultural backgrounds are affected more than others, and this could be to do with their, their cultural backgrounds, their social habits, their working conditions, their economic status. It's nice to know where the problems are so you can deal with them. So the study of ethnic minorities, the study of literary criticism of Canadian literature from all these different perspectives is has a social value, a social usefulness. It's not just, you know, art for art's sake. And I've always seen it that way because it's, it's dealing with the real situation in Canada, the reality of, of Canada. And you see that uh, recent governments, for example, the Trudeau government had ethnic minority people on the cabinet and also the new president-elect uh, in, uh, in the United States, Joseph Biden, Joe Biden, is also going to have ethnic diverse, visible minorities on his cabinet. I've always written, I've always written uh, since, uh, since I was in grade seven. In grade seven, I had a, a new Scottish teacher who gave uh, all her students an assignment, a writing assignment every week to write a page. Some student took the, the, uh, the assignment seriously, I did, and I started writing. And I never looked back. I've, I've, uh, I only realized recently that in all my life, in all my 70 plus years, I've never had writer's block. I've always been able to find something to write about. Anyway, my short stories. My father died in 1997. Uh, he, he, he'd been in the Second World War, he was a, a German prisoner and so forth and so on. So I wrote a story about him because he, uh, he escaped being a German prisoner and got back home. I called it My Father's Escapes, which basically deals with his war experience and his uh, later coming to Canada and so forth. He worked in, in construction and he escaped certain, uh, you know, uh, tricky, uh, dangerous conditions, so he survived. He ended up dying in his garden. You know, the, 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 his favorite spot in the whole world, his garden. That's where he ended up dying. Uh, so I, I, that story was uh, published in 99 in a, an Alberta anthology called Threshold. I was very happy about that, 99.99. And the, uh, the story had a circular, a circular beginning. So it begins with my father escaping through the, uh, the bush of northern Italy, escaping from the Germans, which, which, was a, which is a similar scene that you find in the, in the Lena Wertmüller film, uh, seven, uh, I think it's called Seven Beauties. Okay? So I, I begin with that scene. And I end with the scene of him dying, uh, disappearing in his garden before anybody could notice, dying and continuing to escape. In other words, he escaped the world that way. So it has a circular structure. Anyway, some anthology uh, editor uh, put it in, in a grade 12 anthology, Passages, which is a Canadian anthology for high school students. So it appears in this anthology as, uh, so you know, there I was, you know, almost a, a Hollywood uh, star. So I continued to write. I've, I've written a story about my aunt, my mother's sister, my illegitimate, uh, I call her my illegitimate aunt because of the, circ the circumstances of her birth. Uh, and my, my mother died in 94, uh, when she was only 64, and so I, uh, I wrote about her. So the major story that I've worked on the past, over the past year is a story about her life from the time she was born, uh, when, when my grandmother decided to stay in, in Italy, and so she, my mother had to grow up during the war, uh, the Second World War, she was, she was trained as a nurse, uh, she met my father as a nurse when, uh, in, a, in, a, in a, a doctor's office. Uh, they formed a relationship. Anyway, they got married soon after the war. And uh, as the Germans were, were uh, retreating out of Italy, they got married. Uh, there was such, uh, such austerity that the big meal for their wedding was risotto. To give you an idea, risotto, that was it. Fortunately, they had some Friulano cheese and some uh, Veneto wine, but otherwise it was a very modest, very modest wedding. Um, so they came to, we came to Canada in 52, my father worked in construction, and my mother did, did all kinds of uh, jobs. 
Uh, and uh, she was a very good seamstress. She ended up working in a, uh, a fabric store and she was help, she helping all the women in the neighborhood uh, with the sewing and so forth and so on. So that's, that's the kind of story. So she's an example of, uh, of a very uh, self-motivated, very creative uh, woman, uh, which anybody would like to model after, you know, so she was, uh, so that, that's, that's the story I wrote, I wrote. and uh, so I'm, I'm now working on other members of the family, my Uncle Tony, my, uh, my grandfather, Mondo, you know, his, his trip to Canada, for example, uh, uh, when he was coming back to Canada after, uh, in 1913, yeah, 1913, he, he uh, missed out sailing on the Titanic. So I have that story. He missed out sailing on the Titanic. You know, in other words, if, he, if the train had been on time and everything, he would have been able to sail on the Titanic, which means I probably wouldn't be here. So that's an interesting twist to that story. Uh, so I'm, 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 the, the stories uh, are reconstructed and, and some based on fact of various family members because it's quite exciting. A lot of Italian families have a very colorful uh, background with people traveling and immigrating and, and working in various jobs. So that's, that's the kind of things I've been working on. At the same time, I'm also working on a collection of essays which, which involves academic essays and personal essays. Some of these academics' essays have been rejected by journals for various reasons. Uh, maybe they were too controversial, maybe, uh, you know, whatever. Uh, maybe they didn't like me, who knows. But I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to include, so, there, so there's another collection, another book of essays on, uh, on some of my favorite essays and essays that were rejected. Uh, it's nice to give them the light of day. So that's one of the things I've been working on. And I, I imagine I will, I'll continue to work. Uh, uh, my wife Emma and I will, are continuing to write. We enjoy writing. It's not a chore. Uh, we enjoy being creative. Uh, and, and we enjoy working on books and so forth. So it was a, a very fortunate, uh, serendipitous occasion to meet Antonio, to become involved with Guernica Editions. And, and uh, so the rest is history. We've changed a lot of things with... Uh, with these publications. Uh, I'm quite happy about that. Okay, I think, I think that's about it. Unless, um, um, if Antonio has other questions, we'll have to have another, another clip. Okay, so I'll stop there. We are here in uh, my library. Um, this is part of the collection of Italian Canadian writers. These, these are the ones that write in French and Italian. These are the ones that write in English. And up, up above is Italian Canadian history. So this is just part of it. I have many other books in, uh, in boxes. Why am I here? Up to now, we've talked about the success of Italian Canadian writers and the success in my career. But we also have to point out to failure. And that failure is the fact that Italian Canadian academics have failed to embrace Italian Canadian writers. There are a few who have written the odd book or the odd essay, Francesco Di Gio, uh, Vera Golini, Pasquale Verdicchio has, has published some articles on Italian Canadian writers, um, and myself, of course, myself. Um, but I consider, I consider that I've failed in a sense that I have not been able to stimulate or encourage other uh, academics to embrace Italian Canadian writing. I have given two papers criticizing the, the Association of, of uh, Italian Studies and the University of Toronto Italian Studies program. Why? Because they have not uh, offered any courses or done much research promoting and supporting Italian Canadian writers in Canada, even though 
they depend on uh, on uh, the population for students and their programs. The University of Toronto has uh, supervised 158 PhD theses since, since, since the 1960s. Of that number, only one, one has uh, uh, focused on Italian Canadian writers. All the others have been uh, neglected, forgotten, avoided. The, 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 the Italian Studies Department at the U of T publishes uh, Italian Canadiana, but that is basically a kind of uh, extracurricular activity. It's not part of their curriculum. Their focus is the, is the canon of Italian literature, Dante, the Renaissance, Manzoni, Leopardi, that's sort of, those kind of people. Uh, the uh, Italian Canadian writers, the immigrant writers, uh, they, don't, they don't really exist for all intents and purposes. So that's, that's the big failure that I, that I talked about. Uh, and I've complained to them and I've written about it, but it all falls on deaf ears. So that's, that's why I'm here in my library demonstrating the, the, the critical mass that we have in Italian Canadian writing, even those that write in French and Italian, and yet all these people are neglected. All these people are neglected. It's very sad to document that, but I think in this, in this uh, interview, that has to go on record as something that I've tried to do and have failed to do. Okay? And uh, once I'm gone, there is really nobody to uh, take my place. There are no other uh, young academics that are going to be uh, looking at Italian Canadian writing uh, or so forth and so forth and so on. It, it's going to depend on English Canadian academics and researchers to look at ethnic minority writing. So that's about it. I think that's I think that makes the statement. Thank you. Okay, it was a pleasure to talk to Antonio in Montreal. Okay. Do I have to do anything? No, you don't do anything. You're not supposed to say anything. Okay. It was a pleasure to talk to Antonio in Montreal.